Good evening, everybody. This is Poetry Square, and I'm Diane Funston. This is our monthly program of four readers, myself and three others, forming a square. So that's where it got its name. And I want to thank Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture for producing this program. I'm their um, poet in residence for this year. And I'm trying to expose more people to poetry. You know, it's Zoom is a wonderful venue for that because there are people watching from the entire country. And the nice thing is we have readers from various parts of the country. Tonight, they're all Californians, but we have some upcoming um, pieces that'll be from East Coast and Midwest. So stay tuned for our monthly program. Um, right now, it's kind of a blustery day today. And I think I'll start with a poem called A Blustery Wednesday, even though it's Tuesday. So A Blustery Wednesday, the wind roared all night, all day, lonelier than freight trains, twice as fast as fickle men, howling like women left behind. Rewrite these lines, parallel as railroad tracks, crossing only at intersections, preventing a derailment or other disaster you never see coming. Until it happens and you're thrown again to the other side of the tracks, opposite side of the mountain, down in the valley below. You may land at that cafe again, listening past the wind to words and music, a Wednesday open mic night. You may hear words that soothe the wind or slow hand 12 string that melts your heart. Warmed by kind eyes and familiar faces, feeling so much better when the wind sings along and the railroad backs poetry. Before I moved to uh, this area of Northern California, I lived in Tehachapi, California in the mountains, and you would have the train coming by right behind our open mic. And you would always stop for the train. And sometimes those freight trains were very long, but they always seemed to back the poetry. This next poem is called Roots. I like my roots to tangle, tributaries from the tap root down deep, divining rods to nourishment. But change, that constant companion, kept close ties this year. The pruning loss, at first devastating, forced new shoots to grow. Like an inexperienced rose gardener, in awe of how quickly wounds can heal and spring forth with new life, I too stood amazed at possibility, gain accomplished only focused by losing everything almost. We came through the conflagration, the house fire, the enraged herd of confusion looked towards home that place you still have the key for. Surrounded by rivers and rice, orchards and suburbs, roots again reach down, sprouts grow through scars and possible again. A house is just a house. A home is where we thrive, stretch the limbs, become green again, Blood pulsating, mind awake, growing back. It has been, as we can all agree, quite a year, 2020. This one is called Foggy Afternoon. Enveloped, hidden, secret, secure. The cloud sits on the mountain. Fog thick as felted wool, 
I am in the cocoon of our cabin, under blankets, inside the windows, inside my thoughts, inside the mist-shrouded glass. The front view, skeletal trees dance in heavy layers, a few brave headlights on the main road. The truck in the driveway appears, disappears, reappears. In the back, oak trees wave heavy branches. Deer pass, halt suddenly, seek for clear passage. The wood stove fire crackles, lively orange against the monochrome gray. Alone at home in fog season, the sitting cloud claims my imagination. I still sift through archives of emotions for poetry. Heat meets cold, cold embraces heat. I strike the fire of memory and begin to write. And now we've had some rain, which is a wonderful thing for Myself as a gardener and California certainly as a whole. Um, this is called rain. It is growing close to the time of rain. The scent of it arriving open senses, downpours of memories, a want of keeping inside, holding close, nesting within the created cottage of windows where the rain starts softly, almost unnoticed at first, toward the steady march of showers to cacophony of storm, cataract of water over bedroom skylights, and the earth opening and receiving, green leaves washed clean of complacent summer, drink fill their winter rain, so dry California so many months, then the ecstasy of release. It's growing close to the time of rain. And one of the things that we have um, through the pandemic and through loss of jobs and people out of work are um, people who need to go to food lines and get some extra food to tide themselves through the hard times that many people are going through right now. And this poem is called Commodities. Woman ahead of me apologizes to the intake worker, pleads, I usually help others, but then I got sick. The worker's wrinkled hands reach out. She replies, don't feel bad. Any morning my feet hit the floor of my bedroom's going to be a good day. After standing in a line of anticipation, anonymity drops when faces remember who we were before, perhaps with roles reversed. We unwind from the coiled reptile of need, a mingled skin of many colors, old and babe, able and disabled, uh, cut off from the visible society. I recognize someone handing out fresh celery, the color of childhood lawns. He smiles his bearded grin, asks how my husband's job search is going. I tell him he's in Arizona looking today, talking with Reno tomorrow. He hopes we stay in California. I nod and continue the line. In a mock pantomime of trick and treat, we hold reusable bags open at each giveaway. Applesauce, spinach, rice and beans, French bread, so unlike the baguettes in Paris, a lifetime ago, it seems. Life is temporary. This is temporary for us, a few months at best. We may move, we may stay, we move towards nonetheless. Hard scrabble hands pat my back, kind eyes meet mine. 
Mothers try to quiet their children, like I did once, decades ago, in other places like this. I gather my groceries, carry them to my truck. I find some extras in the bottom of my sack. My humility that I lost a ways back. My faith in God and the kindness of strangers. And I leave feeling all the richer for that. This next one is called uh, Pilgrimage. And I was going to um, go up to Humboldt to my middle son's home for Thanksgiving. But of course, now we're on um, our purple and uh, we're not going. So we won't be going up there. And he lives um, near the Redwoods up in Humboldt and it's beautiful. And this poem is kind of dedicated to that. I walk through deep forest in search of a glimpse of the hidden promise. Armed with camera and binoculars, I hunt for my prize, a sighting of the rare. Along green paths, slogging through rich ground cover of ferns and fiddleheads, my walking sticks lead the way, divining rods toward the secret within. Denser and darker in my imagination, a light. I am drawn deeper into the labyrinth. Thicker on a bit later, perhaps close, the phantom's lair beckons. Seek me here, it says. A silken seduction travels my spine in excitement. A single raven clucks from a Sitka spruce high above my grounded wandering. Then an exalted form comes clearer through the mists. Am I there, I wonder? I hear twigs snap under my feet. Slowly, I come upon the sacred in the sylvan cathedral. A single corpulent trunk ahead of me with upright arms all in a row and reaching higher. The elusive candelabra redwood lies just ahead. A beam of sunlight strikes the wicks of young branches, lit up like altar candles or holiday menorah. Here I find the blessing of my secular church, anointed by the green prayers of nature. And uh, as I mentioned, we'll be having some East Coast uh, readers who will be coming up in future months. And I myself am a native um, Northeastner from Rochester, New York. And this is my poem, No Longer. I no longer live in my hometown. My hometown lives in me. I no longer freeze in winter but memories are frozen in me. Still life photographs, black and white, color tinted in the way artists do to return a blush to cheeks, color to eyes, life to pallor. I prefer the monochrome stark Kodak skies, Xerox copies of lives no longer lived Ice storms, glittering icicle teeth, praying for summer green in parks no longer swinging with children, unsafe with the guns of poverty. Family photographs too, wrinkled, faded, smiles and frowns not forgotten. Annual drives to lakefront amusement parks, bamboo shades on the little yellow porch, with the green and white glider going, going, gone to the Salvation Army, where it all ended up except memories and dreams. Many pieces make the puzzle of self, borrowed, inherited, stolen, envied, set in mortar like yellow brick roads, winding through forests dreamed, far from the city that grew me up, 
closer to the cities of sun and winter rain, settling into the city of bridges and swans, yearning to grow roots and clip wings for just a necessary while. And I'm going to close out my poetry with um, just saying that you're going to have three wonderful readers tonight, um, three Californians, at least in their residence now. And uh, I want you to welcome them. We'll have them one at a time. And we will start with Len Germanera. And he'll say a few words about himself. And then we'll be followed by Chella Corrington, who is in Santa Barbara. And then we'll be closed out with our own Marysville Tom Galvin, uh, who may even include a song if we listen carefully. And uh, again, this is Poetry Square. We're the third Thursday at 7 p.m. every month. And uh, we welcome you to join us. We have different poets every month. And uh, it's, an, it's a nice time. And in our pandemic time, we reach hundreds of people, probably thousands, because here we are, a captive audience, all of us in our own homes. So uh, I want to thank um, our guests tonight. And I want to thank our audience for tuning in on uh, a cool autumn evening and a week before Thanksgiving where I'm sure most of us will be in our own homes celebrating with the ones we live with. And uh, Good evening. My name's Len Germanara. And um, I'm originally from Massachusetts, and you're probably going to gather that after you hear me talk a little bit. I spent most of my time recently on Nantucket and um, spent some time in Colorado and have moved to California and been here a couple of years. I'm so happy to be a guest of Subber, S Sutter, y Yuba Sutter Arts and Diane Funston, and I'm glad to be sharing time with Chella Currington and Tom Galvin. So thank you. I'm going to start with a poem. Um, this was the first poem of the year that I wrote. Um, it was published in the Boston Literary Magazine, and it's called Buckley, His Name Had We Kept Him. Found a blue-black Labrador retriever abandoned on the new year, huddled around a garbage can in a dark park. Obviously shell-shocked, howling terror and WTF in woof. I shared a look with my dog, said, let's help this poor son of a bitch out. It took some doing. Fear like that requires caution. My dog, Swedgen, knows what to do. Never seen him falter in a touchy, candid social encounter. A true tick knot hound. He wags. They wag back. This will be an understanding forged in urine, licks and sniffs the obligatory submissive role. Every move I make reminds him of the night that just passed. So I sit at a slight remove, wait for this puppy to return from the hell of being thrown away. The dogs, tentatively at first, begin to play, while the morning doves ask, Who? Who? He comes around quick as any infant, terror already forgotten, sidles up to me in the hopes that I'll pat him and tell him, it, it's okay, it's okay. I think like so many people, um, I have a whole series of um, COVID thoughts and they are with me most of the time and I have a whole series of COVID poems. This one's called Oran. The dim-witted character Camus envisioned reading the trial sat down next to me at the pig and whistle just around the corner from my flop, ordered a day-old floater and a cup of joe, looked around in confusion, then consternation for lack of an ashtray, lit a nail nonetheless, 
jaw jutted, typical inebriate on a bender. The kind of mug got one more scrap in him. Downed wire, eyes sparking apocalypse for breakfast. Offered me up one of his red apples like he was brandishing a switchblade on Broadway. And I know this is a soon-to-be hopper painting of empty stools, so I reach over the counter, grab the bucket of mud, and say, Hey, death, you want me to top you off? I think we're going to be here for a while. Uh, another COVID poem. Um, it's called Reference Desk. This is the library I've always dreamed of dying in, a flower bed with blooms I can count on returning again and again long after I'm gone. Someone might pick up the Decameron from the middle of the mantle over the fireplace long dormant, sit at my oaken roll-top desk, read about all the irony life has to offer, look at the pictures and brick brac try to decipher without the aid of a proper codex the husk left behind. <clears throat> this is a true story, and it's a field sketch, and it's from my good friend John McKinnon, who um, is also known by the name Crow. Uh, he's a um, person that deals in shamanic Germanies, and um, he's been a friend since we were in college this many years ago. It's called Cupboard's Bear. Who was it, Crow, brought us as present, still warm from nest, one of seven? Trace of red, led us back where six remained asleep. Adjusted for the sudden chill, drew closed curtain fur, plucked and woven with a dutiful mother's precision. A scene from some Jack London yarn. They look like gremlins, downspout ornamentation for a French cathedral where it does not rain, purple gone out of vogue, no one royal anymore, everyone hungry. This next poem is a Thanksgiving poem of sorts, and I think it's a Thanksgiving that a lot of people are going to be um, going through this year where you have to be socially distant at a time in the, the year when you want to be socially as close as you possibly can. This poem is called Cold Comfort. Having spent some time in rooms with no windows, calling to the nurse that does not hear, is not there just trying to do the best she can, for Christ's sakes, knows I took a laxative and I'm entirely unable to do this by myself. I worry for my mother because she's in such a room at present. I call her. The calls often end in baleful whimperings through bit lips. Seldom does she call me by my name. Remember the call ten minutes later. The only solace, if it is in fact solace, is in the knowing she thinks that she's at work. Dad's on the way to pick her up, and tomorrow is Thanksgiving. Simpler this year, because it's just the two of them now. This poem is called Sax on the Wind, and it's a series of blues poems that I've been writing. I'm a cerulean storm front, riding the smell of rain seconds before the first drop heard. Overripe berry stain my hands, pie on the windowsill still waiting for a thief. Just before the boom, boom, boom of John Lee Hooker or the plaintive wail from Joni Mitchell singing blue, I love you. 
in moments of cold, calculating remembrance of all the cloudless moments where, when we were we, the ice between our boundaries now chills me whenever you're near. So I hold my breath, stop my heart from beating bluebells and fare thee wells. A flatted note, especially the third or the seventh degree of the scale. All those notes. I was talking to Tom and everybody uh, before the reading, and we were talking about the fires and when they got started, and Diane had mentioned conflagrations, and this poem was published in the Worcester Magazine this year, and it's called Fire Season. Thank you to Victor and Fante for publishing this. Fire Season. We saw the first sparks of this conflagration. No, we felt them. Wrapped in pre-dawn habits, our morning walk. A dry storm of crackling, static, metallic taste that the dog felt first. A skittish reaction. We watched, waited for the patter that did not come, while the etch-a-sketch of a night sky painted a triptych of exclamation. We went on with our day, our routines, labyrinth and compulsion, the sweep of feet. We've walked every day since, months now, no end in sight. The only thing that remains normal the pre-dawn dark. There's comfort in that. I'm in a couple of different writers groups. Um, one is called Marie Writers, and then there's Nicola Forces writing from the inside out. Um, this poem I um, wrote as a response to a prompt and also a response to a poem that Susan Kelly DeWitt had written about Marie, um, the Marie that the Marie Writers is named for. Her poem is called Butterfly. This poem is called Prompt. I'm always on my guard at a generative writing workshop. Tonight is no exception. On my guard for the ghost of a treasured pet haven't thought of in far too long. Those six kids back home they called a cluster. The smells that drew people to my nana's front door whenever she was in the kitchen, her chicken cacciatore, a siren song. On my guard, prepared and packed, fluids, snack, something to read, in case I finish before the allotted time. Beware the gravitational tug, especially if the workshop is named for Marie. If a butterfly were to pass by at just this instant, fast enough to alter the tides or time, I would not be able to hold back my tears any better than I have while writing this. Nor would I want to. These are tears my grandmother would tell me are good tears. Like the butterfly, a benediction on its way to the blue flower of my heart. A short poem. It's called Certain at Curtains. I will leave you with this. Do with it what you will. This is not so much a manifesto as it is a valediction, boyo. Run your hands over stone until it's worn smooth. Imagine the long, dark hallway of a howl. The rest is only pain. Keep running. You're not going anywhere on a knife's edge. It's always like that in a dream. So what? If you wake... And I hope you do. Search for the pot of misplaced socks at the end of your rainbow. Look into the wine dark. Check for stars. 
know as much leaving as you did on the way in. And um, Shantae, if you could pull up that picture uh, right now, that would be most appreciated. My wife is always telling me, um, my wife has done many more Zoom meetings than we ever have and PowerPoints, et cetera. And she said, it's always good to finish off a reading with a nice sunset picture. And that's a sunset um, as witnessed every night, just about from our um, kitchen in our apartment on Nantucket where we live for 12 years. And this poem is called Coda and it's, a poem about Nantucket, strangely enough, at the end, it finds a way in. Coda. The concluding section of a dance, especially of a pas de deux, or the finale of a ballet in which the dancers parade before the audience. When the flies started falling like media showers, we knew we were in for an ancient horror. By then we were numbly hanging on to nothing, waiting for the final blow, a clean, immediate death, inshallah. Not this creeping death head virus eating like a wild dog, you. Watch, unable to so much as scream. You cannot stop them or die fast enough, helpless as scallops storm-tossed from codium, from spat to spit, gone by the next Rack line washed ashore. We are no longer jetsam, more a great gyre of things we hadn't taken into account. You know, consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Good evening. It's so nice to be a part of the group with Diane and Shante, Tom and Lynn. It's just a, a thrill to be able to read tonight. And earlier we were talking about while there are all kinds of reservations about this pandemic, of course, we're going through. It's terrible with everyone losing family and friends that an underside of maybe a silver lining is the fact that we're able to communicate with so many more people through Zoom. So that makes this reading tonight especially special. The first poem I'm going to read is a poem dedicated to my dearest and sweetest cousin, Jim Buck Hall. The Pond Heron. The dead don't write, but my cousin's letter arrives three days after he's blown away by some kid in his own platoon. Maybe another Georgia boy who'd never been so far from home. So scared he shoots at anything moving in shadows. The letter feels light for my cousin's voice. He speaks of sheer petals rising out of muddy fields, spreading before the sun, of a copper heron in shallow water who dips his black-tipped beak to spear his prey. My next poem is in honor of my father. And when Diane was talking about the train and the weather is a train, I grew up in a small town where the Crescent City ran through twice a day, early in the morning and late at night. And it was the train on the way to New Orleans. And my dad had spent 10 of his younger years as a fireman on the Crescent City. He, my dad was from North Alabama and worked, uh, spent a lot of his time in a steel mill and then as a fireman on the train. 
jeopardy. My father built biceps working for U.S. Steel, smelting iron in heat that humbled men. Now I could break his arm over my knee. Brittle is kindling. My father used to let me walk up his body, balancing my hands on his fingertips till I flew from his shoulders. They began to sag after my mother passed. Rising at night, no moon out, she collapsed in the dark and never woke. As once my father fell when a clot in his head tossed him down. He speaks of my mother rubbing his back with eucalyptus oil and saves hair from her brush, strands he wraps in Kleenex. At night with his whiskey facing jeopardy, my father drifts off to Kargasak. In the Russian mountains, women live to be 105. So do their men, eating dried cod with mushroom tea making love last forever. I grew up in Southern Appalachian um, in North Alabama. And so a lot of these poems, which are from a fairly recent chapbook, which I'm going to do some advertising now from In Their Own Way, and it's available at Amazon and it the Crow Publishing House. This is one of the poems also. 13. We hate the tall grass by the river, afraid we'll step on a cotton mouth. But water the color of indigo waits for us the other side of danger. We shed jeans, shirts, underwear, Mark our place at the edge. Hold hands like Ruth and Naomi, wading into the deep. With each step, the water moves higher, chills our new breast. I throw my arms around Anna Claire, press against her for warmth. She pushes away, plunges into the dark blue, Scan swims under me and cradles my back in her palms, lifting me to the air so I float on her fingertips. Her hands move gently, touching my shoulder and thigh as she kisses my lips, uncloses my eyes with her tongue. We don't say a word, reach the point of mooring, and venture back through the tall grass. I should have dedicated that to Anna Claire. She's now living in the far mountains of Tennessee. 40. Dust devils swirl to Beethoven's fifth, and sun burns my eyes between Albuquerque and Grant. Living in this forsaken land is unimaginable until I see shadows on desert hills and think of Georgia O'Keeffe traveling across New Mexico watercolors dislarging dark New York. Her lover, old enough to be her father, posing her day after day in his studio, infatuations in black and white. Stieglitz dies. She escapes to open plains, cloud vistas where nothing presses. No camera traps, no skyscraper blocks, 
her stretching into whiteness. Bone on Red Hills. This is dedicated to my dear friend Annie, or was dedicated, who now lives in New Mexico near Albuquerque. And earlier, I think it was Lynn who mentioned his shamanic friend. Annie is quite a shamanic friend herself. This is another poem that she inspired called Passage. She finds a dead hawk, body still warm, drops him in her brown backpack. Like a winged warrior, raises her arms to migrate with the untethered and takes off to preserve the remains. Careful as a shaman, she washes him bone by bone, douses quills and alcohol, stores his down in a cedar box, invokes his spirit to stay seven days until the body is at rest. This poem is inspired by Georgia O'Keeffe and one of her lovely orchids, the green orchid with the yellow spilling on the edges. Mama's Orchid. Girl, just look at that flower. All green and yellow, swimming together, spilling over the edge like rainbow sherbet Mama made in July and spooned into glass cups that slipped from our sticky hands, crashing on the black and white linoleum she laid when too old to bear children. Just look at those petals, fringed in lavender, a feather boa she tossed over her shoulder, cascading down a satin back Saturday nights, as Daddy dipped her to radio blues, with us praying for long legs and to pat, stay up past nine when Ella and Billy brought it on home. Never cared for real orchids, those hot house types, too busy being fussed over, still don't bloom, like that purple flower Mama loved to wear on her birthday and afterward stored in the ice box till petals turned brown. Looks like we do have a lot of humid in the air. My pages are sticking together. And I've been working on a series of mythic poems, trying to retell the mythic story from the woman's point of view. And one of these poems is entitled Eurydice. Women have cried over my confinement, inhaled by a husband who loved me so he could not turn away, could not abide the caveat. Those long, dark days, underground, breathless. I have not lived yearning for him. I'm fine. Did you really believe he wanted me on earth with him? Orpheus, the beloved singer. What would he sing if I were there? For his song, he needed me buried beneath the crushing ground, star-crossed love that could never vanish because it never was. He didn't desire a woman bloody with menstrual rituals whose body once luminous would be taken by time. Orpheus could not accept such a betrayal. He wanted me as an imp, not crone. 
Even more than age, he feared my voice, afraid it would rise above his. What did he know of suffering and forgiveness? I was the one severed from the sun, shut in subterranean darkness, barely enough oxygen. He could have joined me the day I descended, a knife to his throat, a serpent to his breast, but he did none of these, came to me later by other hands. I have no use for him. So I'm ending on that note. Thank you for coming tonight, and thanks to the other poets and to Shante for coordinating this. And have a good week and a good Thanksgiving. Well, I'm just thoroughly impressed uh, with uh, the preceding poets, uh, Diane and, and uh, uh, Len. And it's, I'm just uh, what I what I just heard here from Cello and uh, just inspired me. Both all three of you are so great to be inspired by such wonderful poets. I'm Tom Galvin. I'm the musician in residence at Yuba Sutter uh, Arts and Culture. I'm a psychotherapist. Uh, maintain a small practice and semi-retirement, but I'm not re much retired because I still write. I play a lot of music. I'm a retired uh, traveling musician as well. A lot of stuff. Um, and uh, with all that, I've managed to maintain a high level of anonymity. And I'm going to read some poems that might explain why. This is called The To-Do List. <clears throat> it's not staring at me. It's, it's not. That's all in my mind. Words on paper is all it is. Guilt. It grows alongside guilt. Do all this and your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven, my son, and a few Hail, Mary, Hail Marys wouldn't hurt. Writing this takes time away from other items on the list. Moderate exercise, clean the house, saxophone practice, call home, meet, meditate, while imagining awards given for each crossed-off item like plenary indulgences, reducing days in purgatory of OCD-driven driven demands on myself, myself, struggling to stay out of hell, working my way down the soul-saving list to find five minutes of heaven. The to-do is all done. The scrap of paper crumbled and tossed away. Movie scenes. <clears throat> Love letters found in the attic, 30 years old, read like someone else's movie. We who were young and skinny and beautiful flash on the screen and fade. The soundstage was full of mountains and big buildings and other cities. And lines we spoke, locked into past love's tragedies, can't be changed no matter how much we cringe and wish to say now the things that never came to mind. We made love or we never made love. The director denies us one more take and we've moved on, retired, living comfortably in the Midwest with no cameras rolling, crying out for a comeback in other cities with better lives. Paradox. When my workaholic friend heard me say relax, he panicked. Not my fault. On a rare vacation, he nearly shot himself. Who knows the outcome had he not stopped to clean his gun. He slugs down coffee, which he never stops to smell. His wife says she's worried. I say, why? Give him lots of household tasks, then go take a nap. He told me I can't change. I said, change takes work. That seemed to help. I'm just going to say one thing about this poem. I wrote this recovering from triple bypass surgery in the middle of some night, feeling like a truck had run, run over me and listening to the sounds outside my window of the dark night. <clears throat> it's called Sorry If I Woke You. <clears throat> Sirens in the night. Who died? Who was shot in the head? Who's in a race with red lights, fibrillator shocking his heart in the back of a hospital van while I stir from sleep? How embarrassed I'd feel to be the cause of all that noise. Can't you please hush that bleeding crescendo and those honks at intersections where patient drivers are made to pull over and miss the green light? <laughs> I don't want to make a scene when my heart gives out, barely breathing, a building on my chest, careening through the dark, paramedics yank from coffee and donuts to fetch me off the floor onto the gurney, calculating how much time I'll add to their paperwork. But then, why not? 
It's my crisis. We each deserve the right to wake the night and cause a chaos of, chaos of noise to shout after us as we go on our way. <clears throat> and the winner is, God won the Oscar for best deity last night. Monotheist claimed there was no contest, but the critics had high praise for the other nominees, Allah, the goddess, Satan, and Zeus in a comeback role. God was, of course, perfect as the county commissioner fighting for a nativity scene on the courthouse lawn. As per usual, his performance was powerful, but the others were no less transcendent. Allah shown in the scene where he tells the dead terrorist, whoever promised you 17 virgins lied, you idiot. And Satan, playing Gene Simmons in the Kiss biopic, seemed to capture the rock icon's very soul. In a role suited to him, Zeus was thunderous as, he was, as the washed-up king of the gods, and the goddess was sexy and stunning, playing a homicide cop in a low-cut sweater. Tom Hanks naturally presented the award and only revealed later that God and Satan had tied. But somehow, he admitted to friends, I felt compelled to say, and the winner is God, as if I had no free will. The losers drowned their sorrows at post-Oscar parties. Satan kept sticking his tongue out at starless. The goddess chatted up Madonna. Allah set fire to the bar. And Zeus set, sat in the bal balcony above it all. God was a no-show. The paparazzis waited to catch his entrance, to capture his image. But with no luck, as one said to the other, I don't think this one ever appears in public. <clears throat> Somewhere over the silo. Somewhere over the silo, there's a, I'm sorry, let me start again, please. Somewhere over the rainbow, there's a grain silo. Rainbows, well, they come and go. The silo is forever, like the mail pouch ad on the red barn slanted roof, always and forever, grain and nicotine. Can't live without one or with the other. And you can't eat or smoke or chew a rainbow, so what good is it without a camera? And even if you snap it, they'll say, so what? It's just a rainbow, and what's over it is anybody's guess. Your cousin Ed's or Judy Garland's. One guess is as good as another in a fantasy land. But there's no guesswork in a grain silo. Stop and go. I have a job as a philosopher at the stop and go down the street where coffee and thought can be had inside or at the drive through I'll have a coffee light, and what's it all mean? I say... How about a crueler with the java? And meaning is subjective. An uncertain woman studies the menu, says, I think, pauses, and I say, therefore you are, and she settles on a short latte. The categorical imperative comes with cappuccino. The existential espresso is sipped while sitting alone, wondering if you should have chosen the French roast. Cartesian dualism goes best with coffee and a donut. Hedonists buy cream sticks by the box. Buddhists order nothing. Aristotelians eat moderately. Today I gave two weeks notice, having find, found God in a fine Colombian brew that made everything clear and answered all my questions. <clears throat> all my friends. Weren't these the same people sitting in a Northern California Starbucks sip, sipping latte in a Peoria star, Starbucks just last week? Texting, buried in e-books, cramming for tests, Staring into space, the same clownish old man is still trying to charm the long-legged barista who's playing him for tips. How did they all wind up here? And will they all keep the same seats next week in a Kansas City Starbucks where the stout woman holds up the coffee line awaited, un, awaiting unneeded pastries and obscure facts are pursued on Apple laptops all the way to the bathroom? We all meet daily for coffee, coast to coast, and maybe nod, but never speak despite all of us sipping from the same espresso pot. This next song is called Neuroscience for Dummy, Dummies, and I came up with that title before I actually saw the self-help book, Neuroscience for Dummies. Well, anyway, this is called Neuroscience for Dummies. The back of my mind must have something to say. I store so much, so much there for remembering one day, things to consider, thoughts to say, all stared there, stored there in neurons and brave wa brain waves at the back of my brain, under my hair. <clears throat> Strange space, hippocampus, reticulus, call it what you will, everything in there, all the minutia dumped in memory's landfill, somewhere in the brain, 
<clears throat> where tentacles of tiny things hide a lot of pain, emerging now and then to sting. And all that neuron fibrillation is me, organizing excavations to retrieve memories or keep them buried deep, the hurtful kind, so I can sleep with nothing in mind. Uh, this is called being and nothingness. I looked inside for substance and changed what's looked at by looking. That notable funny man, Jean-Paul Sartre, is making, me, is making the me looked at vanish. Sartre might say, nothing lasts forever but nothingness. Sure he would, he's dead, but still speaks to me through a thick book that baffles and fills my empty cup of awareness with thoughts grasped like glitter that shines and fades and is and then is not. The final poem I'm going to read um, is called Monkey Mind. I'm a, I'm a songwriter and you'll notice a bit of kind of a lyrical aspect to this. I'm a bad meditator, focus on my breath and try to concentrate like it was life and death. Oh, by the way, this is called Monkey Mind. Let me take it from the top. I'm a, da I'm a bad meditator, focus on my breath and try to concentrate like it was life and death, which actually it is, without my breath I'm dead. But I'm a bad meditator, can't get out of my own head. I'm a bad meditator. My mantra ought to be, Om Namah Shivaya. Oh my God, woe is me. My brain is like a monkey that jumps from tree to tree. And all this meditating makes a monkey out of me. My thoughts always wander, wander and roam. Somebody show me the way to go Om. Let your mind be empty. That's what they say. But I don't even know how to say Namaste. I'm a bad meditator. I'm always wishing my back wouldn't ache in the lotus position. My third eye is blind, my ch chakras aren't aligned. I'm a bad meditator, got a monkey mind. I'm a bad meditator, nothing seems to calm me. I disappoint my guru, infuriate my swami. I try to hear the silence, God knows I wanna. I'm not doing very well at achieving nirvana because my thoughts always wander, they wander in Rome. Somebody show me the way to go home. Let your mind be empty, that's what they say, but I don't even know how to say namaste. If I have time, maybe for one more thing, I'd like to sing a song. I'm the, as Diane is the uh, poet in residence at, at Yuba Center Arts. I'm the musician in residence. So uh, this is a very simple song. I write satire, some acoustic rock. I played music for a lot of years on the road, but this is a very simple melody that I just thought was appropriate for tonight's Poetry Slam. Thank you so much, Diane, for having me. Thank you, Len and Shella, for, uh, I just loved your work. I hope we can keep in touch. <laughs> Ballads born in autumn on the Great Lakes, we were taught to sing about lost love and loneliness with winter closing in. Ballads from Lake Erie where the freighters carry iron ore and deckhands to Wisconsin while the true loves wait at home. And like the fires warm you from the cold winds always blowing, there's a warmth in those old sad love songs that shakes chill away. I haven't sung them for so long, the subtle phrase, the quiet song, the simple three chord melody to softly close the day. Ballads born in autumn on the Great Lakes, we were taught to sing about lost love and loneliness, winter closing in. Ballads from Lake Erie, where the freighters carry iron ore and deckhands to Wisconsin while the true loves wait at home. The North Coast is a cold coast where the red leaves fall and freeze there on the path that leads back to the frozen lake just past the trees. We huddle close together for the warmth we give each other that flows out from our bodies, from our thoughts, from our smiles. And I said, ballads born in autumn on the Great Lakes. We were taught to sing about our lost love and loneliness with winter closing in. Ballads from Lake Erie where the freighters carry iron ore and deckhands to Wisconsin while the true loves wait at home. Thank you so much, and good night. And thank you for everyone who joined in tonight. Uh, we had another great Poetry Square. My thanks to Len, Chella, and Tom um, 
for a great night and even closed out with a song. So thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll see you next month.